Am I good to go, uh, Mrs. Bingaman? You are now. Okay. Uh, my name Can is Frida. Yes, and I'll good. be your interpreter today. Mi nombre es Frida y seré su intérprete el día de hoy. I'll give this message both in English and in Spanish. Dar este mensaje tanto en inglés como en español. In order to provide language access, this meeting will have simultaneous bidirectional interpretation into English and Spanish. If you're bilingual, you don't have to click anything. However, if you're not bilingual, please locate that icon shaped like a globe at the bottom of your screen, click on that, and then select English. If you're on an iPad or your phone or a similar device, then locate the three dot menu in the upper right part of your corner, select interpretation, and then select English. When you speak, do so in a paused manner because the interpreter is going to be interpreting simultaneously everything you say. A efecto de proporcionar acceso lingüístico, esta, interpretación, esta reunión contará con interpretación bidireccional simultánea al inglés y al español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Pero si usted no es bilingüe, por favor localice el icono en forma de globo que está en la parte inferior de su pantalla, seleccione interpretación y después elija español o Spanish. Si usted está en su teléfono o un iPad o un dispositivo similar, entonces localice el menú de tres puntos que está en la parte superior derecha de su pantalla, haga clic en interpretación y después seleccione español o Spanish. Cuando hable, hágalo en español y en forma pausada, dado que el intérprete estará simultáneamente interpretando todo lo que usted diga. Antes de que me vaya, ¿alguien tiene alguna pregunta respecto a la interpretación? Before I go, uh, does anyone have a question regarding the interpretation feature? Well, thank you. Uh, if you give me uh, one minute, I'll assign myself and then we may begin. Thank you. Okay, are you going to uh, give hosting back to me, Frida? Okay. Okay, welcome and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for your patience. We wanna make sure that everyone can access and understand the training. So we are glad to have Frida here to translate. And today is the first time we are trying to record the Spanish version as well as the English version. So thank you for your patience with that. Um, my name is Sonia Bingaman and I'm the manager of the State Council on Developmental Disabilities Sacramento Regional Office. Uh, we cover 10 counties around Sacramento. That is Sacramento, Yuba, Sutter, Calusa, Yolo, Placer, Nevada, uh, Sierra, Alpine, and uh, El Dorado counties. So uh, a big territory with lots of counties. And uh, we also understand that many of you are from all over the state. So we welcome you. Dread of um, territory is, is growing and is, is um, larger than just our area. So we welcomed anyone from around the state to join the call today and learn more about what's happening with DREDIF. So welcome. Um, the State Council on Developmental Disabilities is established by state and federal law as an independent state agency to ensure that people with developmental disabilities and their families have access to the services and supports that they need. Through advocacy, capacity building and systemic change, uh, SCDD works to achieve a consumer and family-friendly, uh, family-based system of individualized services, supports, and other assistance. Uh, feel free to use the chat to ask any questions. Also, feel free to just un unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, we have a relatively small group today, and um, so we want to make sure that your questions are answered, and feel free to just unmute and ask, put your question in the chat. Um, raise your hand, uh, whatever is most comfortable for you. Uh, toward the end of our hour, I will launch a poll with two simple questions. I will read those questions at that time. And if you can just select uh, one of the answers, it's just about satisfaction with the training today. So thank you for your participation with that. 
Um, we are recording the training. If you're uncomfortable um, with having your real name revealed, you're welcome to change your name um, in case you're going to ask a detailed question. But actually, we prefer that you save detailed, personalized questions for um, a private conversation with Dredif um, offline. So, you know, let's keep questions to general things that you're comfortable sharing because it will be available um, for anyone to watch on YouTube. So, just wanted to put that out there. Um, so we're excited to be partnering with DREDIF, getting to know the services and supports that they offer and how we can work together uh, in the coming year and partnering with many of you. Um, half of you are parent, parents and family members and half of you are professionals and staff members. So we're glad to have all of you with us today. All right, well, I want to turn it over and introduce Diana Vega and Kenya Martinez, who both uh, work for DREDIF and help to organize this chat. And I will turn it over to you, Diana, and let you take it away. Oh, hi, good morning. Um, my name is Diana Vega. I'm a bilingual education equity advocate along with my colleagues, um, Kenya, Cheryl, and Julie, who are all in attendance as well. And uh, we just um, want to introduce ourselves and learn from you a little bit. Um, I am a parent of three uh, children with disabilities. I have been an advocate. I have been advocating for them for the past, what, 18 years. I have been with DREDF for about two years. And, um, I'm very excited to be working with you, uh, collaborating and learning more about um, the needs in your area. Um, so thank you so much, Sonia, for inviting us. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Kenya Martinez and I am an educational advocate with DREDF. I've been working with DREDF for a little bit over a year. I know um, a, a good portion of you here, so Thank you for um, allowing us to have this. Um, um, thank you for inviting us, Sonia, and allowing us to introduce ourselves to the um, rest of the region. And I'm gonna hand it over to um, Cheryl, my other colleague. It's always a good day when I remember to unmute. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Cheryl Thies. I am honored to work with my colleagues, uh, Diana, Kenya, and Julie, who'll come on next. I have five kids, two of them have had an IEP and one a 504 plan. And I've actually been a mother for 45 years today. So I'm, you know, it's, it's, and I'm not done. I have still have a 14 year old at home. Um, and I've been with Dreda for about 15 years and do a lot of the work, uh, especially around some of our most vulnerable families, children in foster care, uh, children, you know, refugee and immigrant children, um, not the Spanish speaking ones, because Diana and Julie have that expertise. Um, and just I'm really really happy about serving the larger community because I feel like we're learning so much about the challenges that you that you face we're, we're anxious to hear more about them today and we are um, really looking forward to a great collaboration with all of you so I'll leave it to Julie hi good morning everyone my name is Julia Peraza I'm a bilingual education advocate with the Disability Rights Education Defense Fund, where I started off 16 years ago volunteering um, and was ultimately hired. Uh, so like many of you, I am a parent with a child with a, uh, multiple disabilities. So um, I've been fortunate enough to meet professionals from you know, the education field, the medical field, the, um, the state uh, agencies, and I'm just really happy to be here today and uh, looking forward to working closely with all of you in the future. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, Diana, do you wanna go ahead and start with a brief PowerPoint to give a orientation? And I just also want to remind uh, yeah. Uh, any, yeah, any latecomers um, that we do have simultaneous Spanish translation happening. And if that is required, then look toward the bottom of your screen for the globe, select that and select Spanish. And then you'll be in the Spanish channel. Thank you. 
All right, so um, thank you again. Um, so a little bit about TREDEF. Uh, we are a unique alliance of uh, people with disabilities or parents of children with disabilities. Uh, so anybody that works with TREDEF either have a disability themselves or a child with a disability. Uh, we believe that um, anybody could live a full life independent of discrimination and I mean, a full life and independent free of discrimination. And then uh, we provide technical information for parents. Um, we not only work with families, but we educate legislators and policy makers on issues such as the IDEA, uh, which is a special education law or the ADA um, that affect the rights of people with disabilities. Um, and then uh, we're a PTI, Parent Training and Information Center. There is one in every state and territory of the US. Um, and we believe that children who have knowledgeable and consistent advocates are most likely to receive the appropriate services and support. Uh, information is power. And then we, um, like I said, we, it, we provide trainings and information uh, for parents. Um, so here are the counties that we cover. Uh, we are collaborating with um, Matrix. Um, so if you live in any of these counties on the screen, you could call us at DREDEF, and there's, that's the phone number and the email, and then um, maybe if someone can help me put it in the chat for uh, the participants, that would be great. And um, if you live in any of the, the counties listed on, on the screen, um, you would call Matrix Parent Network and Resource Center, and that's their phone number listed on the screen as well. Um, so we are, like I said, we're very excited to be um, working with you guys. And um, I'm sorry. In addition to that, uh, we also provide training both in English and Spanish, and we will provide interpretations for any other languages upon request. Uh, we provide ASL um, interpretation as well if it's um, requested or any accommodations. If you want to check out our calendar, uh, just click on the link attached, and I believe Sonia will be emailing this um, to all of you. And then um, let me see if I can share this um, the flyer, and I'll uh, we'll send that to you as well, both in English and Spanish. Um, so, so this is our flyer, and uh, we we're listing the services that we do. And anybody, um, Gerald or Kenya or Julie, feel free to chime in um, if you have any additional information that we want to share. Um, well, I, guess I just want to I just want to add, Diana, that um, just to go to back for a minute, that you know, Dredif, we do more than education work, but it's an important part of our work. Um, so what Diana said about we are a disability civil rights organization, so we see disability rights as, as civil rights. So a lot of our work at DREDF right now is actually dealing with COVID-19. Our, our legal team and policy teams have been working on, you know, how to make sure caregivers can have access to the hospital and things like that. But the Parent Training Information Center, which is what we're talking about today, um, we do, you know, we talk to people on the phone. We're doing a lot of Zoom meetings. Um, we talk to community providers and and parents and families. Um, we do trainings and then we, you know, do this policy work. Go ahead, Diana. Okay, and then on the screen, um, I'm I'm gonna make sure that also the the presentation is available in Spanish, so we can email it to you both in English and Spanish. Uh, so here are the days of the upcoming training. Every training that we do, we have it um, like two weeks later or a week later in Spanish as well. Um, the one on December 14th, uh, we are going to have available uh, interpretation and then we are going to have a Spanish and ASL interpretation as well, captioning. Um, so feel free to attend us next Monday. Um, all of our trainings are on, via Zoom from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Um, and then we also have a special edition that is a monthly newsletter that we write for parents and guardians and professionals. And then um, we have very important topics that are uh, pertinent to special education. So if you'd like to subscribe 
just make sure to click on the link um, and then we can put the link on the chat and um, and then sign up for the for the uh, monthly newsletters which are both both available in English and Spanish as well um, and then if you need some help uh, like I said feel free to call us um, there are other PTIs in California but um, Dredif and Matrix are your PTIs right now. Um, so if you have any questions for us, we are happy to answer them. I'm gonna leave um, this on the screen if you wanna screenshot it for our information right away. Um, but like I said, the PowerPoint will be available. Um, so Julie and Kenya or Cheryl, do you wanna add anything? Did I miss something? I think we just want to hear your questions. I know that um, you had some specific ones. So let's spend our time addressing what, what your issues, issues and questions are, if that's OK. I believe it's on you, Sonia. You had a list of questions that you wanted to ask us. So let's get started. I do. Um, yeah, uh, Diana, if you could take that down now, um, that would be great. We will share that out with everyone. Oh, that's great feel like we're back in the classroom together. Thank you. So I wanted to start by asking, um, there are other organizations that have been doing parent training, um, especially regarding special education. Um, and so how does someone know who to call? So in our area, we have Warmline, we have Family Soup, a little bit farther north, we have Rowell, Family Empowerment, um, and there's other groups throughout the state. Um, those are the three that I've, you know, worked with the most in the past, as well as, uh, well, there's, there's, there are others. Um, so, so how do we know what kinds of things to look to dread it for? And how does a parent know, do I still call uh, warm line or do we call DREDIF now if we have a question about IEPs? If it, it, I'm not sure who of you is best to help us kind of parse that out. So um, I could jump in. I think the easiest answer to give everyone is just call DREDIF. And if we're not the agency that's going to provide the training, we'll let you know who is. And if we're not the direct parent training information center that's going to provide direct technical support, we'll let you know who is. So I think the safest answer is just call DREDIF. We will help you. Only because the map is so big right now. And um, I think we're, we're also, um, you know, finding it difficult to give an easy easy answer because then somebody hears something and then they think oh well if dredif is doing that training maybe they're doing the training for this county too so just to make it super easy for everyone i would say just call dredif and we will either let you know um, what our process is for signing up for a training or what our process is for um, requesting a training for your agency or your group. Um, and if we're not your technical support center, then we will, um, we will assist you uh, in finding uh, your, your, your center. And I guess I would also add, I, like I see Cindy Chandler. Hi, Cindy. I'm from Family Super. So yeah. one thing to be clear is that, so the Parent Training and Information Centers were created by Congress when, when this special education law passed because we, you know, people, the advocacy community said, these are great that there are all these laws, but how in the world is the average parent going to actually know how to use them? They're so complicated. So the Parent Training and Information Centers, our focus is really on helping parents understand what your rights and your child's rights are, and also how to use them effectively, how to collaborate with your district, how to solve problems, how to resolve things at the local level, etc. So we don't, for example, do support, you know, parent support groups per se, you know, we're not doing that piece of it, which is a critical piece, especially right now, I think for a lot of families, but that's outside of our wheelhouse. Um, so Julie's right, you can call us and say, you know, I'm looking for support, my child's in mental health crisis, I need to talk to someone. And we might say, well, you know, we can help you with the school situation, but you might want to call this other agency to get, you know, emotional support or, you know, join a support group or, or you know, deal with health care issues and so on. So we're, our focus is really targeted toward, for children with disabilities, whether it's a 
you think they might need disability support or they have a 504 plan or they have an IEP and helping you participate effectively, solve problems, um, and, and really know what your options are. We're not lawyers, so we're never going to give you any legal advice. We're just going to say, you know, here, here's what the law says. You know, we might even like send it to you. Um, and here's some options that you have in resolving this issue and help you hopefully solve it directly with your school district. And we should say whenever we say school district, we also mean charter schools. We're just so used to saying school district, but charter schools are covered by all the same laws. So I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in. Cheryl, so is that um, for families up to age, basically who have, have children up to 21, 22, or do you go beyond that? The PTI serve fam uh, youth up to 26. We're real sticklers. If your child, it's always going to be your child, if you're a parent, is 18, we want to have them included in the conversation, unless there's really a situation where they're unable to. Um, and then we're going to still want something that shows that we can talk to you. Um, because we also really focus more and more recently on helping youth. You know, uh, we do a, a lot of my work at DREDF has been around transition to adulthood. I participated pretty actively on that um, for many years. So up to 26 is what the federal uh, mandate for the PTI says that we do. So we talk to college students who are trying to get disabled student services. We talk to parents of three-year-olds who are just transitioning from regional center services to school-based services. Give us a call. So even though you go up to 26, it's still education focused. Exactly. So now, not, people, not housing or. Yeah. And people call us and they'll say, you know, I'm calling because you helped me with my child's IEP and now he's 21 and his SSI just got denied or something. And we give people referrals because we are, you know, as a larger organization, we do all kinds of disability rights stuff on housing and healthcare and so on. But the Parent Training and Information Center is education focused. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. So I'm encouraged to hear that, you know, <clears throat> you may be referring families back to other parent organizations, because we know the local lay of the land and which administrators they should be talking to and so forth. Um, but I think sometimes parents get overwhelmed and calling an agency that they're not familiar with. So, you know, um, I'm hoping that you'll be able to re actually refer parents to the parent organizations such as Family Soup and Warm Line, you know, with a, we have an online form that, you know, that could be filled out so that we can call, we'll have consent to call the family rather than them trying to squeeze this into their uh, schedule, busy schedule, and maybe they're um, reticent to, you know, make that call. So I'm hoping, you know, we'll just open up the doors of referral as well. One thing we do a lot is we talk, you know, we get a lot of referrals from community organizations. Now we don't ever, we're never going to call a parent without the parent calling us first. Um, but um, often it's a community organization who's reaching out first. And sometimes it's people from the community or based organizations, because you're right, Cindy, you know, you, you have your finger on the pulse of like, Who's the best person in that district to call about that? I mean, that information is gold, right? It's just so invaluable. Um, but often it's us saying, well, let's get the parent on the phone and talk together. Or do you, you know, do you want to collaborate on a training together and that kind of stuff? So we're, we're really looking forward to those kinds of partnerships. And, and we always encourage parents to sign up and professionals to sign up first for our trainings um, because we, there's only four of us. We don't have the bandwidth to, you know, serve every support group to do every training and, you know, or PTI me or PTA meeting or special education parents meeting. So we really encourage everybody to look at our calendar and sign up for our trainings, which we hold monthly um, and sometimes bi-monthly, uh, depending on the training. And then from there, we're happy to um, speak to any professional um, in general, but we never discuss a specific case or situation, um, obviously because of privacy issues. So, um, and again, just reiterating what Cheryl said, we are not attorneys, we are technical um, support. So we will give you your different options and, and maybe even teach you the concept behind it, um, but we will not tell you 
this is this is what you should be doing. This is what you should be requesting. This is what you should be, you know, filing with the CVE or with the Office for Civil Rights. We are not going to tell you to do something. We're just going to explain to you your different options. And if you need an attorney, we'll refer you to, um, we have a whole list of attorneys, not within DREDF, but in, from other organizations. So, um, so we're, we're here to help you. That's good to hear, Juliet. And I just wanted to um, highlight something going on in the chat in case you're not looking at that, but some questions about, I've never heard about DREDF before. You know, where did, where did you come from? Um, so yeah, this is new and that's why we are happy to have uh, folks from DREDF here to talk about their services. Um, um, Kenya put in the chat that this is starting October 1st their um, grant and the area that they serve expanded. So this is new. So if you haven't heard of DREDF before, that's okay. That's why we're here to introduce DREDF and let them speak for themselves. So um, absolutely. Um, so uh, Cheryl or, or Juliet or Diana, um, would, would you ever go to an IEP meeting with a family? So the way we decide that is um, we make all decisions as a team. And it has to be a really compelling reason. We don't say no. We don't say yes. What we say is that it's, um, we, we, we come together twice a week and we talk about all of our um, families that we're serving. And we might say, um, come across a parent who's monolingual, other language speaking, who has literacy issues in both languages, um, or bilingual literacy issues in both languages or um, literacy issues in their own language um, or has a disability themselves um, or is really unable to advocate on their own. And when we do attend an IEP meeting, we bring that situation to our team meeting and then we discuss it and we brainstorm, okay, how can we teach this person and how can we model for them prior to the IEP meeting so that they can establish this relationship with their school district? Because it's not a sustainable relationship for us to be that intricately involved in um, helping the parent advocate. So when we do do this and all four of us are in agreement that one of us should be going to an IEP meeting, it's because we've really discussed that this is, this is really necessary. Now, when we do go to an IEP meeting, we do not represent the parent. We have an advocacy agreement that specifically details what our role is at the meeting, um, support, technical support for um, the parent, maybe help them model um, how to prepare themselves for the meeting, maybe help them um, you know, bring their agenda to the team prior to the meeting. We do a lot of upfront work. Um, so, and that might include um, having their assessments in front of them um, and discussing their options there. there. There's a lot that goes to the decision. It's not just, sure, we'll come with you. I mean, personally, I love going to IEP meetings. <laughs> there's no better way to learn. Um, I personally have been to hundreds of IEP meetings, not just for my son, but for you know, all of the families that DREDF has served um, in the last 16 years. And those were, those relationships are really important. Um, and we're here to teach parents so that they can do this on their own. Our goal at DREDF is to empower parents. It's not to, you know, go in there and like, well, and Julie, if, if I can interrupt you, I'm sorry. I just want to say like probably nine out of 10 times, we're not going to go. Um, Cheryl, you know, your dog is about to pull off your tablecloth behind you. <laughs> foster puppy. Um, okay. mind. Um, why did I sign up? Because I have a 14 year old with a disability who thought this would be a great project. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's what I call it takes a village. Um, <laughs> so I just want to say that nine times out of 10, we're, we're going to say no, because our job is not to go and represent a family. Our job is to help families participate. So there are those occasional situations, you know, we had a family who, you know, spoke a, a language from Latin America that wasn't Spanish either, wasn't literate in Spanish or English, um, had a child with really significant issues and it was a crisis. 
Um, and so in that situation, we agreed that we, one of us would go to model for the parent that you can say no, that you can, you know, respectfully say, you know, I need you to hear what I have to say and so on. So that's what we're trying to do is increase the parent's participation in the rare situation where we go. But it is a very unusual for us to go. And, and like Julie said, we agree as a team that it's really an exceptional situation. Right. Let me ask a question that was um, asked in the chat, um, and and that is um, if during the pandemic you're seeing any uh, increased issues with Spanish-speaking families accessing educational supports, um, has the pandemic specifically uh, highlighted some issues with those families specifically? I say, oh, since I'm one of the bilingual advocates, the biggest issue that I've seen is the um, equity and accessibility issue. Uh, so I've noticed that a lot of families are just struggling because not, they, don't, they don't know how to access technology. Uh, not only they have the barrier of the language, uh, but they just um, are having a really hard time um, finding a way um, to collaborate with the school district. Um, so, yeah, I think that has been the biggest challenge that I've seen. Um, it's, I just wanted to add, it's not just for um, our monolingual Spanish-speaking families, but also for um, just poor, poorer families, families who, um, this is, it's evident now, now that we're in the pandemic, that a lot of our families who are experiencing um, homelessness or would be considered um, socio socioeconomically disadvantaged, which I hate that word, but um, who do not have access to things like um, hotspots or technology, or they're still being given paper packets. Um, so this is, it's, the divide has become incredible since we've been in the pandemic, particularly for um, monolingual and for poor, poorer families. Yeah, I would. I so agree, Kenya. I think what we are seeing at Dreddeff is that the families that were already marginalized and vulnerable, for all the reasons that everyone on this call can understand, those families have been pushed even farther. So I did participate yesterday with a family who's in Humboldt, who's in a very rural area, and it's a Native American child, and literally that they, they've got nothing but a packet dropped off once a week. Um, and internet is an issue and there's all kinds. So that's what we're seeing is that the families who have resources are, are partnering up and hiring a teacher. And you know, it's, it's hard on everyone. There's no question, but it's definitely whatever the gap was before, because we all know that before COVID there were gaps, big gaps, they're even bigger now. Yeah, I, I agree with my colleagues. Um, I think that every problem that previously existed is just magnified now. And um, they didn't, my, my friends, my colleagues didn't touch on this, but one of, the, one of the things that I've been seeing a lot of is parents that have more than one child. And that's been really, really challenging. And, and parents that have more than one child with a disability has been really, really challenging. And I think that at the beginning, it was so strange at the beginning, the four of us were like watching our phones, just waiting for the phone to ring. You know, <laughs> we're like, we're ready. We're going to take these calls. And it was weird. We didn't have any calls for like, I don't know, like the first two or three weeks of, of the pandemic. And, and we chalked it up to parents just for stealing with the most pressing, urgent need in their home, which was you know, how are we going to, how are we going to manage our household? How are we going to stay safe? How are we going to put food on the table? How are we going to keep our jobs? And then all of a sudden, you know, we started getting our calls again. But um, yeah, I, I think it's just magnified. And, and, uh, and then obviously the other big issue um, was, is that school districts are refusing to assess. And so we've been hearing a lot of those stories and addressing those stories directly with, um, you know, other agencies and um, directly with school districts. One of the things that DREDF does, um, which is really amazing, is we don't represent parents individually, but 
if we start seeing a systemic, um, you know, a systemic problem, uh, we will take that to our education attorneys and, um, and address it as a systemic issue. issue. So I, I think that that's, that's how I think we're different than other parent training information centers. We have the ability to, um, to collaborate and to get legal advice from our attorneys um, when we have questions and then they, they help us. Um, see the broader picture. So I'm, I'm seeing a, a question from somebody about who is dreaded. Sonia, is that the, was that the next question? Um, yeah, Cheryl put so, some links in there, but please go ahead and share verbally. That would be great. Um, so I'll say a little bit and then my colleagues can chime in too. I'm particularly um, proud of working at this agency um, that's been around since 1979 is a leading national civil rights and law and policy center directed by individuals with disabilities and parents who have children with disabilities. Uh, one of the one of our of our mission is to advance civil and human rights of people with disabilities through legal advocacy, training, education, public policy, and le legislative development. Um, we work with uh, the core principles of equality, opportunity, disability, accommodation, accessibility, and inclusion by employing the following strategies. And you can see this too on our website, dreadif.org. So we provide training and education, legal advocacy, public policy, and um, our, our directing attorney who just retired recently, Arlene Mayerson, was one of the leading authors of the Americans with Disabilities Act and, um, and is the reason why all of you can watch Netflix with closed captioning. <laughs> so, um, so we see issues and, and our attorneys see issues and we, um, it, gets, it gets addressed. So one of the, one of, Two of our founding members were part of the Section 504 sit-in, um, and I can't tell you that story now because it's it's too long of a story. But it's a beautiful story if you can look that up. Um, they can us. watch. They can watch Crip Camp. Yeah. Yes. 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 And Dreadif also has a video about Section 504 and how our founding members were part of that. So it's a larger organization. Um, the I have to say probably the only thing we don't do is support groups, I would say. But other than that, we're, um, you know, we're here to uh, advance the rights of people with disabilities and, uh, and support those that do. What is your funding source? We have a, well, the PTI has a small, um, not a small grant, but we have a grant from the U.S. Department of Education um, and then we have uh, donors, we have donations and grants and uh, I'm not like the numbers person, Cheryl probably knows more about the numbers, but um, it is a, uh, a nonprofit. Uh, you know, we're funded, our, our, our larger work is funded by all kinds of people, including we were the first disability organization to ever get a grant from the Ford Foundation It never funded disability, believe it or not. Right. So we worked on that for a long time. So we, so a variety of things, as Julie said. Um, but I, you know, we're, we're always like, we don't ever charge for any of our work in the parent training information center, but we certainly say, you know, we welcome donations because that is a big part of our funding. I think it's about a quarter of our funding. is just private donations. I think I just wanted to add um, what I, the historical context for me for working for DREDF is that um, Dredif um, actually handled the case for least restrictive environment um, uh, uh, for Sac City, suing Sac City Unified okay. School District. Um, so the Rachel H case, the Rachel Holland case. Yes. Um, the reason why we have least restrictive environment is because of Dredif. So me as a resident of Sacramento, I am extremely proud to work for this organization because of that. So I just yeah. wanted to highlight that fact. Yeah, I heard about, I was here when that happened. 
Yes, I remember yeah. that very well. And I think, you know, what Kenya is pointing to is that a big part of our philosophy comes out of the disability rights movement, which is nothing about us without us. So that's why when we're talking to someone who has a young person, we want that person involved in the conversation and everything that we do. We want, we bring the voices of families to legislation. You know, when we're trying to pass, the disability community is trying to pass laws to make sure that, for example, IEP documents can be translated into Spanish in a timely manner. Um, you know, we bring up families to hear, to bring their, their voices to the state legislator, uh, legislators. So that kind of stuff's real important to us. One of the most common questions that we're getting and, and that Cindy has raised here in the chat is about com compensatory um, education and, and loss of time and, and learning and um, access to classes. And, and I'm wondering what your perspective is on what kind of advice you give to parents or what you've seen districts doing. <laughs> so the first thing we do is we don't give advice. I, I, sorry about the <laughs> advice. What information um, you share, um, sure. you know, yeah, thank you. Sure. So um, I could take a little bit of this. Sure. Compensatory education means to bring the student to his educational, his or her educational position they would be in had there not been some sort of a procedural violation or a denial of a free appropriate public education. And it's, it's most ideally based, and compensatory education can be a variety of things, right? It could be service, it could be a private school, it could be service, it could be um, a variety of things. So, um, and delivered in, in a future time if necessary. So I can get comp ed right now for my kid and not, not receive it until maybe two summers from now when I feel like it's the right time. So compensatory education is ideally determined by assessment. So I would want to get somebody that can see what his present level is now, what it was before and what I believe for this professional believes it could be. So, um, so we look at the past, we look now, and then we look forward. Um, but this touches on legal advice. And I think the technical information that, that I specifically give parents is um, to document. Document everything that's happening right now. Document all the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, videotape your child. Uh, have a diary of you know, your kid doesn't want to um, be on Zoom or your child is experiencing an intense amount of um, mental health crisis um, or your child is doing really great and they are loving the Zoom social time with their friends um, or they're enjoying the, the PT coming to the house and going for a walk instead of doing adapted PE. So and I, really, I think, you know, yeah. what you hit on is exactly the thing that that we all, and, and Kenya, I'd love to hear you weigh on this too, because I know you've been talking to a lot of families lately. It doesn't come naturally for most families to be documentarians, right? To be keeping mm -hmm. logs and writing stuff. I mean, that's just, you know, most of us are, one of the things Kenya has been a breath of fresh air about, right, if it's keeping us honest about making sure that our information is provided in a way families can use and understand. Um, because when we say compensatory education, most families go, uh oh, that sounds like something, you know, hard. But it's mostly, as Julie said, about helping families understand that you're the expert on your child and you're living this and you see what's happening right now. And so whatever works for you, whether it's pictures or videos or jotting down that, you know, your child had used to have one meltdown a week and now you're seeing it every day that that's gonna be really inform important information because when school comes back, and gosh, it's not looking great right now, is it? Um, when we're back in person full-time, uh, you know, I think a lot of the school districts are, and charters are saying, we'll see how the kids are doing then. Um, and really, this is the situation where you wanna start documenting now. So Kenya, I wanted to give you some space to talk about what you're seeing, because I know you've been talking to a lot of families, especially already um, in your area. Um, what I've been seeing is a, more so a lot about um, the assessments and basically parents um, not having a very good understanding or being um, instructed by districts that they're unable to perform 
in-person assessments. And so um, this is why um, parents should call the PTI, their local PTI, to find out the technical information that they need as far as assessments are concerned. Um, regarding the other areas is the compensatory hours, um, what, what I'm seeing more than anything is just that parents are really overwhelmed and are looking for alternative um, ways to, I guess, be a teacher at home. And I, I just wanted you guys to know, like all of us, um, I, you know, Diana said in the beginning that all of us, all of the employees of Jada either have a disability or have a child with a disability. And that includes us educational advocates. Um, so um, we're doing this, we're um, navigating working from home as well with our children with disabilities. So um, I, I don't know what else to add other than that. And um, I guess I'll just take it back to you, Sonia, if you wanted to ask. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, let me. Have um, like five minutes. I know. Let me launch the poll quickly and get that out of the way, and then we can go on and, and speak for a few minutes to answer more questions. So I'm going to um, launch this. It should show up in your screen. I will read it. Um, did Did you learn something about Dredif and their parent support services today? Options are yes or no. And are you satisfied with this training? And the answer options are yes or no. Um, we'll leave that up for a minute. Why don't we open it to the audience? Is there Absolutely. anyone who wants to um, unmute themselves and ask a question? Or we're waiting for everyone to answer. I don't know if everyone has answered. Yeah, go ahead and keep answering. We'll wait a, a few more seconds on that. But yeah, feel free to just take yourself off mute and ask any question you'd like. So, Sonia, can I just address something somebody wrote that we have to measure the support offered from the public education system and we have to monitor the support that is being provided. Um, I would just say that during this time, um, it would be great to remind the families that we serve and, um, and parents um, that services Free appropriate public education is not based on what's available. It's based on an individual educational need by that student. That's what it's based on. So yes, it's nice to monitor what the school's providing. I mean, that's fine if you're a numbers kind of person, but I think it's, it's critical right now to request assessment, document what your child needs, and, and base the offer of faith on that, on what your child needs specifically, not what's being offered. Because what's being offered could vary throughout the entire country, between even districts within the same, um, or the same schools within the same district. So I think it's really important for parents to know that the federal law is, um, you know, in effect and that they should, um, use it, use, use it, walk in with it in their hand and request a free appropriate public education. Cindy, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your attorneys. Are they on staff or just um, on retainer? Are some of them located in other parts of your uh, PTI, like Sacramento? <laughs> Diana or Kenya, you so, want to grab that? Our attorneys, our attorneys are um, employees of Strata. Um, they are working on different issues, like dis disability related issues. So we have people working on the health sector, transportation, education. Uh, we have someone working in Washington. Uh, we also have staff working uh, in New York. Um, so we're all over the country, like we want to make an impact, not just um, in the disability community and all the issues that affect disability. Um, but our attorneys do not represent cases one by one. Uh, we do more systemic issues in, um, yeah, anybody? That yeah, so, so we have a list of attorneys that we, when a parent says, you know, I, 
I've reached an impasse with my IEP team and I just feel like, you know, we're going to have to, I have to take this to the next level. We will say, you know, it sounds like you might want to speak with an attorney. Do you want a copy of our list? And that list, you know, there are people there that do cross state work, work across California and some people who are more local and I'm sure our list will grow now that we're covering a larger area. In fact, if any of you, you know, have referrals for some things we could add to our resource list, we'd love to, to know about it. Um, but we do try to, one thing we do do every year is make sure that anyone who's on our list is not an all-inclusive list for sure, has, um, you know, is in good standing with the bar and has the right credentials and so on. And we also keep a list of uh, local people who do things like independent evaluations and so on. Again, it's not inclusive, but if you know of someone that you think might be useful to add to our list in your area, we'd love to add them as well. And are those okay, on Sonia? your website? <clears throat> Sonia? This is yep. Darlene Anderson. Darlene. Okay. I, wa I wanted to just say that, you know, going through the whole public education system for my children, and my oldest is 36, who was gifted in gate. And as you know, my youngest had, was severely immune retarded, communication handicap, and winded up being autistic and highly, highly functioning. He graduated with a one-on-one -on -one aid. I'm going to tell you, parents have to understand that there is a process to education and there is a goal at the end of every year. And I don't believe a lot of parents understand because even children with special education are receiving letter grades of F. And what does an F mean? It doesn't mean F and below basic is not representing the children. And districts have been allowed to push children forward without making any meaningful progress. And there are people like us who would participate in this call and understand that that's going on every day. But then there are parents who are totally clueless as to the support of what is needed to even transition from kindergarten or pre-kindergarten to first grade. And the training and the opportunities for parents have to be more solid like they were when I was involved in public education, like because CASE was around and they had parents training parents and other opportunities for parents to continually register for and empower themselves. But this system that we're living under right now, under the Black Lives Matter issue, simply because we can see open murder of African American people because they're undereducated and would be expected to be committing a crime if they're out there and they have no other way and means of making financial support for their children. 12 years of going through this system and participating at the level that I had the ability to under the CAC in Sacramento, under the, what, the, the consolidated application process for the district of Sac City Unified School District as a parent, independent, single parent, raising my three boys, all of my children made it, but I can look back and see all the children who didn't and understand that their parents have zero knowledge and zero expectation at the end of year outcomes for children because below basic, far, low, far below basic mean that those children are not integrated in the public school system. I think we all know it, but we, if we don't change now, we never will. That's what I'll say. And I think that our responsibility to the outcomes and the measurement of the maintenance of effort for people who are working in education for these children and their lives end at the, at the end of 12th grade. It's just unbearable. That's why we have COVID and I think we all need to wake up, but thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Darlene. Miss Darlene, I miss you. I miss you at the board meetings. I really do. I just want to <laughs> say thank you uh, for bringing up this issue. Like part of the, our, our goal at DREDF is to educate and empower parents and let them know you have a voice you know exactly what works for, for your child. You know, a lot of the times I have people calling me and they said, I need to know what works for my child. And I said, only you know what works. Uh, so come to our trainings. Uh, we do trainings on different topics. Um, and then I'll share the uh, training link on the chat. Uh, but we want to empower parents. We don't want to take your voice away because we know right. what works for you. you you're the only, you're the expert on your child. But all I'm saying is that the requirement for parent support or parent engagement has changed. Here in Nevada, they have an organization called FACES. These are all employed people working throughout the district with really no commitment to serve that, part, that portion of parent engagement. But I think that there should be some kind of penalty engaged with districts 
who are not meeting that for their for their people that are that they're educating uh, and unless there's a, some kind of consequence and people have to do this then they're not going to do this because failure has become an option and when they have 80 percent uh incarceration rate here in Clark County, and then when only seven African American children graduated with the ability to go to the UC Standard Center, and then you know they had a 256 percent suspension exposure rate for the behavioral infraction, higher than any other ethnic group. Black people are so dysfunctional, but I understand that dysfunction because when I'm seeing young white American able-bodied children working in Goodwill, and that is a training ground for employment after high school, then I'm saying something's very wrong. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we should have entry level positions and children have the ability to access those programs. Why are we paying so much in federal allocations to local communities when they cannot measure the maintenance of effort for the population of people they're supposed to be nurturing and measuring the growth and development. And we as professionals, I mean, I consider myself a professional because all of my children graduated with high school diplomas. And the youngest one, they said severely mental retarded and communication handicap would not make it, he made it. And he is very educated, more educated, but he still has the same disability. He's still autistic and he still likes to just live in that room. He doesn't want to go beyond that. And so we all have our challenges in life. But I'm saying that we're living in the greatest nation in the world. And because we, <clears throat> Do not step up and demand the accountability that we should. But these people are working with our dollars, your tax dollars. You're paying for people to not provide services, basically, to not hold themselves accountable. And how can we be more effective as community people? Darlene, if I, if I can just say, yes. first of all, thank you. Thank you for your, your feedback yes. and your input about it. I just have to say that a big part of what we do at Dreadus in the PTI, a lot of the calls that we get, and not just during COVID, like you say, this is an ongoing systemic issue, is what is the difference between remediating and helping a child close the gap between where they are and where they should be and just accommodating? Um, and so that's a, a lot of parents don't understand that. So we hope people will, that you'll all refer people to us that we, that we um, you know, can help them understand that you have a right to say, how are we going to close this gap? Not just how are we going to pass this child along? That's such an issue. But, and fact, there's huge. Yeah. But I'm just you're saying sure that the requirement for districts to send employees who are working with children with disabilities to check off a training that they've received to ensure that access right. that they're helping to provide access. We don't have any links to the public education system at this moment. They are totally free to do what they do because of the waiver and because there's an underfunding of the federal dollars for public education, but that's irrelevant when you're the, putting too many kids in prison. It's irrelevant. The, the thing that jumps out at me um, through this discussion is through the IEP process, and this makes me crazy, there's a box that says, were you able to participate in the development of your child's IEP? And so many districts, um, Ms. Anderson, say, they, they automatically check that box. They automatically check it. So if you can't even participate, you can, if you can't even participate in, in, in putting a check next to your own box, that's, that to me is a huge problem. But so, no, I mean, but actually, I would, mm -hmm. I yeah, would like to say because- the Director of Special Education mm. for, happened to be my district, and I said, you are pre-printing these IEPs with the box already checked. That's unacceptable. And if, if I see that there are multiple boxes, multiple IEPs, because we serve a lot of families in this, in this district, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I continue to see this box pre-determined checked, mm -hmm. then this is something that's going to be a larger issue for your district. I highly encourage you mm -hmm. to go back to your machine and uncheck the box and let the parent decide whether they want to check that box or not. Well, so, yeah. I, I wanted to give one, Darlene, if we could let see if there's anyone else that has a question because we are over time. But um, is there anyone else who has a question? Because we were supposed to stop at 11 minutes, but um, if Dredd, if it's willing to stay for a couple minutes, were there any other sure. questions? I see Margaret, hi, Margaret. Any other questions for Dredif or? Oh, okay. 
I, I just want to say I see uh, Elena on the call from Raul, and we failed to mention that we're also partnering with Raul to do some trainings up in that neck of the woods. And so I just wanted to give her a shout out. Okay, great. Hi there. There's Elena. <laughs> Thank you for partnering with Family Soup too. <laughs> yeah, Cindy, it's great to have you all here. And and um, with Family Soup and Warmline, we have new executive directors at both organizations. So you know, we all want to get to know each other and work together and collaborate. And in my perspective, that's been the best thing about if it, if there's a best thing, the best thing about COVID and the pandemic is that people have kind of dropped their walls and their silos and everyone is reaching out and helping and stepping up to do what we can to help the community. So I appreciate everyone partnering and there's some good things that have come out of all of this, um, obviously daily and minute by minute struggles, um, you know, for everyone. But um, I think the community has also realized that we all need to work together. We all have similar issues and mm -hmm. um, and let's do what we can to work together and not um, not say we don't do that or we do this or we don't do that. Um, and so we're, you know, we, we just all need to keep working together for the good of our communities. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all the staff from Dreda for joining us. Um, thank you, Darlene. Thank you. Yeah. So and and uh, everyone who had questions. Um, so Thank you again. I will send an email out with a list of the recording and some of the information, the PowerPoint in English and Spanish, and um, definitely sign up with Dredif to be notified about their trainings. Um, we'll all spread the word um, and uh, be safe. Happy holidays. Um, and again, thank you all. Um, thank, you. And thank you to thank the interpreter you. and thank yes. you on health for recording. Um, this interpretation in Spanish. And thank you for inviting us. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good one.